Good morning. I feel like I'm interrupting recess. And I feel bad about that, but I'm excited to have a chance to welcome you this morning to the Library of Congress. I'm Leanne Potter. I direct the Office of Learning and Innovation here. And it really is my pleasure to welcome you this morning on this beautiful spring day. I think the stars must be aligned because it is a perfect spring morning to be here in Washington. So. You guys are charmed. As you know, today we're here for our symposium, first, on diversity in children's literature, followed by the Walter Awards. The program this morning is entitled Read, Discover, Grow, and it is being co-hosted by both the library and We Need Diverse Books. I think we need to do a good shout out to We Need Diverse Books. As most of you know, We Need Diverse Books is a nonprofit organization whose aim is to help produce and promote literature that reflects and honors the lives of all young people. Yay. This program is being live streamed, so if you want to do a shout out to, you know, your nieces and nephews and children and sisters and brothers, now's your chance. Go ahead and wave. Oh, you know, when I do that with kids, they get all over it. <laughs> just, just saying. Um, I do want to thank our audience at a distance for joining us as well, especially those in time zones other than ours. You know, for those folks in uh, the mountain time zone and uh, on the West Coast, it's a really early morning for them. So thanks to those at a distance. Thank you as well to colleagues who are in this room who are making this live stream happen and making this recording happen. Um, magic like that doesn't happen by itself. So thank you, guys. Um, I'm excited to introduce this morning's panel moderator. Um, but before I do, I have to tell you a little short story. Um, my parents think it's horrible that I no longer subscribe to a regular daily newspaper. So when they come to visit, they make sure that the Wall Street Journal weekend edition is at my house. And so they've now gotten us a subscription to the weekend edition of the journal, so it's always there. And I'm happy to report I've gotten into the habit of reading it every Saturday morning, especially the review section. 
And I happen to have my little cutout here of the Wall Street Journal review section from February 2nd of this year. And I, this is where my story comes in. So on that Saturday, February 2nd, while reading the review section of the journal, I came across an article entitled Handing Out the Hardware. In it, I read the following. Each year, the Newbery Medal goes to the book considered by the selection committee to be the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. This year, it went to Meg Medina's kind-hearted novel for nine to 12-year-olds, Mercy Suarez Changes Gears. Although the article continued, I simply squealed and shouted for the rest of my family to hear, hey, I know her, this is cool. <laughs> Um, and it is cool. Meg Medina is a good friend to the library, and I am glad that my path has crossed with hers a number of, on a number of occasions. She is the 2019 John Newberry Medal recipient. She is also a Cuban-American author who writes picture books, middle grade, and young adult fiction. Her YA novels include Burn, Baby, Burn, and The Girl Who Silenced the Wind. Her picture books include Mango, Abuela, and Me, and Tia Isa Wants a Car. Meg's works have been called heartbreaking, lyrical, and must-haves for every collection. In addition to the Newberry, they have earned her the Pura Belpri Medal and Honors and Ezra Jack Keats Award. Meg's works have also been long listed for the National Book Award and were twice named as finalists for the prestigious Kirkus Prize for Young People's Fiction. Her work examines how cultures intersect as seen through the eyes of young people. When she's not writing, Meg works on community projects that support girls, Latino youth, and or literacy. She lives with her family in Richmond, Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Meg Medina, who will be serving as our panel moderator. It's so nice to be here this morning, and I want to call up my friends to join me um, today. Thank you very much for that welcome. And hi, everybody at home and on the West Coast, and welcome to the young people who are with us today. Um, I have very short bios. You're going to hear more about these exquisite people in a moment. But for now, when I um, call you, just come on up, please. The first person is Tiffany Jackson. <laughs> Tiffany is the author of the critically acclaimed Allegedly and Monday's Not Coming, which recently won the Coretta Scott King John Steptoe New Talent Award. <laughs> A TV professional by day, um, novelist by night. We have to talk about this. Um, she received her BA from Howard University and her MA in Media Studies from the New School. Woo! Next up. Emily XR Pan. <laughs> Emily is the New York Times bestselling author of a book I love, The Astonishing Color of After, which was a finalist also for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Oh, um, <laughs> long listed for the Carnegie Medal, uh, Medal and um, I'm sorry, and she was the recipient of the Apala Honor Award. Emily currently lives in Brooklyn, New York, but was originally from the Midwest um, and born to immigrant parents from Taiwan. Next up, mi amigo, David Bowles. Come on up. <laughs> David is a Mexican-American author from South Texas, where he teaches at the University of Texas, Rio Grande uh, Valley. His books have received the Pura Belpre honor and have been included on Kirkus Best YA Books 2018. And last but definitely not least, Vera Haranandani. <laughs> Vera is the author of The Night Diary, which received a Newbery Honor 
um, this year and the 2018 Malka Penn Award for Human Rights in Children's Literature. She's a former book editor at Simon & Schuster and she now teaches creative writing at Sarah Lawrence College Writing Institute. Please give them all a big round. So this is how it's gonna work, people. I don't like podiums, so I am gonna go sit with my friends and we are going to have a chat. Um, I have given them a sneak peek into questions, but the idea is for us to interrupt each other, to add to each other's comments, to take us on wild excursions away from these questions. Um, you know, it's free flowing. And I think they're game because they're all book people and they love us, so I say we're in, okay? All right, here I go. Okay, is my mic on? You can hear me? Okay, so the first thing I was curious about, um, because all of your novels um, were, had such voice, all of them. We have a novel about a girl um, in part at the time of partition writing a diary to her mom who's no longer living. We have a boy trying to make sense of his life and his family and his identity. We have a girl struggling with her mother's suicide. We have a story of a girl trying to make sense and discover the reasons behind the disappearance of a dear friend. And what came across to me for all of them is just the sense of voice. So I think the first thing I want to ask you is, for you in your novels, where did you find this person that was going to lead that novel? Where was your protagonist? How did you find them? Um, did you find story first or the person first? Give us some sense of that. And I'm going to pick on poor Tiffany. You were close. She was like, no, no, not me, not me. I was secretly trying to say it with my eyes, like, no. Don't do it, Nick. Don't do it. Um, so the main protagonist in Monday's Not Coming, uh, her name is Claudia. And she honestly, I sort of dialed into myself, um, me as a child. I was a relatively a shy child. Um, I had a best friend that I didn't really want to share with anyone. I still don't like to share my toys today. Um, I also had a learning disability and I, I lived in my own bubble. So it was really actually easy for me to write something like this because it was easy for me to just dial into my own personal experiences, um, to find that kid that I pretended not to be, but I truly was when I look back on her. Anybody else? Where did you find your people? For me, this, I started with the story, which is, I know, very odd because the book is so character driven. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I wanted to write uh, about a girl who was hearing her grandmother's stories for the first time because the grandmother in my book is shamelessly ripped off of my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> like, basically, copy, paste. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to, I, I had this gap of this character to fill and then it took me many years to start to dive into myself. It took me a really long time to be willing to go there. I think I was really afraid at first. I think in the beginning I was like, oh, I'm gonna write about this totally fictional person completely different from me because you know I didn't wanna like dig up shadows and explore all these things that were conflicts in my brain, were, were things that I was trying to wrestle with myself. And so that was an interesting process. I wrote many, many drafts and finally arrived at a place where I was like, oh, I have to, I have to talk about me and my experience with my family and what it felt like to straddle different identities growing up. So that was the thing that was keeping you, that notion of um, identity and, and fear, was that? Am I hearing that right? Yeah, I mean, in original drafts of the book, my character was very, very, every single time I rewrote the book, it was a completely different cast of characters except for the grandmother's character because she was my grandmother. Emily, but, that's a lot of pages. <laughs> it is a lot of pages and a lot of characters. Okay. <laughs> and then when I finally landed upon Lee's character, it became this way of expressing and exploring all these things that I didn't even realize I was still wrestling with from my childhood of like, you know, not quite fitting into this culture and not quite fitting into that culture mm -hmm. and trying to find my place in the world. And how about a little yeah. 
So yeah, well, um, They Call Me Weddle didn't really begin as a novel in verse. It was originally meant to be kind of like a character study, a collection of poems in a boy's voice just to, to get across the complexity of the Mexican-American identity and, and try to break with a lot of the stereotypes and push back against some of the, the, the noise that we hear in society right now. Um, the, the first poem I wrote was, it was even before I had thought of the idea of the book, it was a poem called Border Kid that was commissioned by Janet Wong and Sylvia Vardell for an anthology they did right after the election that kind of helped kids uh, of color who were kind of distraught about the, the things they were hearing the leaders of our country saying to grapple with their, their anxiety through poetry. And so I, I wrote this poem called Border Kid and um, it was reprinted in the Journal of Children's Literature, and then I read it when I was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters. And as I was coming down off the stage, an editor came up to me and said, I love that poem, and if you can write another 50 poems in that kid's voice, <laughs> I'll publish it. So I was like, I, that was not on my writing calendar. But, but so I, I, I sat down and started trying to find out who this kid was, um, and I realized that while uh, his identity intersected with mine. He was also partly my son, partly the, the boys that I had taught when I was a, a middle school teacher for nine years, partly just the other, my cousins and, you know, other muchachos traviesos of, of the area. And, you know, bit by bit, this, this complex, real human character just blossomed. And I, after a while, I could hear his voice so clearly that the poems just like came naturally, just poured out of me. It was, it's, it's a gift when that happens. Um, and, and that's, Weddle's kind of an amalgamation of all these wonderful things about being a Mexican-American boy on the border. Um, unique, a, you know, a Gen Z kid who's kind of a nerd. He's travieso, he's mischievous, he gets in trouble with his friends, but he's got a good heart. He doesn't mean any, any real malice by it. Um, he's beginning to fall in love for the first time, and, and he's deeply rooted in this community, but he's a Mexican-American kid in 2019, so he's also grappling with like all kinds of bullying at the local level and at the national level as well. And poetry, he finds poetry. He has a teacher who helps him to discover it. And he finds his voice, and I found his voice, and that's, it's nice. That it's a good thing because yeah. 50 poems yeah. is hard to write without without a voice. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> he came I mean, through. You can, but it's it's really came through. Robotic and boring, right? Evira, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, it, that idea of sort of finding your voice and finding your character's voice, and it's sort of two different. And then your character finding their voice. Mm -hmm. There are all these layers of voice. I feel like that you're kind of unearthing. And I started um, the Night Diary, kind of really way back, and I knew that I wanted to write a story about the 1947 partition of India. I wanted it to be inspired by my own father's experiences and my father's family's experiences, but I really wasn't sure how to access it. Um, and so, you know, I, I started actually with a, a young male character, and I was just like in third person, my very early sketches. And as I was, I was kind of writing pieces, I realized I was trying to write my father's story, which is not really what I wanted to do. I wanted it to have that connection, um, but I also needed a more personal connection with the main character. Um, and so I sort of moved that male character over, and Nisha kind of blossomed, the main character, and I knew that somehow she was very quiet, very shy, um, and would have trouble talking to people outside of her family, um, but she would be able to express herself in a diary and find her voice that way. And then creating Nisha, writing in her diary, helped me figure out kind of my voice for the book and her voice, and then her finding her voice. So all of those layers. Yeah, which brings us, I was thinking also about just the form, the way you guys, um, decided to tell your story, because that's a, that's a thing, right? You're sitting there and you could say, you could tell the same story in so many ways. So in your case, it's an epistolary novel. You, you're telling it through a diary. So uh, you guys played with time, uh, sometimes chronology, sometimes magical realism. How, how did you decide on your form? Like, was, did that, I, I hear now how Vera did it, but how about the rest of you? Did you, uh, was that conscious? Did you experiment with other ways of telling this story? Or did it flow pretty much from the beginning? You're looking at me again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> You'll forgive me one day, <laughs> Tiffany. So, um, so Monday's Not Coming is told in a series of befores and afters. So it's before Monday, the, um, Claudia's best friend, before Monday, as disappearance and after. And I did that honestly uh, for a threefold reason. One, I really wanted everyone to get to know Monday and Claudia. I wanted them to get to know their relationship. I wanted them to see it build and see it blossom and see how best friends could really love each other. And two, or a second reason, is I didn't want, specifically because I write thrillers. Um, and if you notice a lot of thrillers, there's always sort of like a dead girl in the background and she's not really talked about. And I didn't want Monday to be just another dead girl. I wanted her to actually like really thrive on the page for you to really get to know her. So whenever the outcome of the story is, you're more affected by it because you know the girl. It's not just like, you know, a phantom person. Three, I really wanted this story to be an experience. So I wanted, of course, it seems like the chapters are sort of all over the place, but that's exactly how Claudia was feeling. She was, disturbed, she was frustrated, she was confused. Um, she was dealing with her own learning disabilities. She was dealing with the fact that she had a best friend that was missing and felt like no one else seemed to acknowledge that. So I wanted her feelings to really, I wanted the reader's feelings to parallel Claudia's feelings. So that was sort of like, it was sort of a threefold, like kind of, yeah. you know, a mixed stew there. It the, was challenging though, the, the time, manipulating time that way. Oh yeah, It was Girl. tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and to be honest, I didn't originally write it that way. I actually wrote it in chronological order. And then of course, like many of my books, I come up with an idea out of nowhere. And I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and I was like, oh, oh, we should do it this way. And that's literally what I did. And honestly, the only reason why I was able to even remotely do it and not completely drive myself crazy is because I do have a film background. So I take every chapter and I consider it like a scene. So I was able to rearrange everything just like you would do in an edit room. And that was the only way. So when people are like, oh, teach me how to do this, I was like, I'm gonna. Right. <laughs> Get a media degree. <laughs> That was actually one of my questions also that I wanted to range on was all of you have these colorful, incredible backgrounds, professional backgrounds, like you've done other stuff, TV. Um, but you know, Vera was an editor, David's a professor. And so like, I, I'm wondering like, how do your past experiences, how did they help shape how you attack maybe the structure of the novel and so on? So I see cer certainly the film part of it and how you would tell a story like this. And to say that you write a thriller is like the biggest understatement. <laughs> I, re I read this book like, you know, <laughs> in terror, basically. Um, <laughs> so just be warned. Um, but I definitely saw that. So how do your past experiences, how did it help you tell it in, in terms of how you picked the form? And I feel like you just made the question so much harder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Every, tricky everybody, that way. Everyone on this end had I'm already prepared I'm tricky to that way. Yeah, we like, all, whoever wants we to jump in, <laughs> you can be brave. You can be brave. I, I mean, my background is kind of all over the place, and I feel like my book is kind of all over the place. So, good. See what, I, see what I did there. Okay. I, <laughs> Um, I wish I could write like a, a book that's linear chronology start to finish. I think my life would be so much easier. Mm. Um, but I start writing and then I immediately get bored and I got to throw a wrench into things <laughs> and then I got to throw another wrench into things and then suddenly I'm juggling multiple timelines and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> um, yeah. And I, for me, it was also that uh, I, I sort of hinted upon how I, I do iterative drafting. So uh, my drafts tend to look hugely different from previous drafts. And so when we sold, when my agent and I sold the book, it actually was more of a fantasy novel. It like cut back and forth between a fantasy world and the real world, and it was all braided together. And then there were different timelines within those also. And then I realized the fantasy world really wasn't working the way I wanted it to. It, it sort of took the weight out of the story I was really trying to tell. And so I ended up stripping that entirely out of the book but I still needed to somehow be able to access memories from the past because in the book, uh, Lee gets um, these memories that belong to other people that, that she couldn't have gotten any other way except via magical means. And so through that, 
the need to fill that kind of guided my, my timeline and my jumping around. And then I ended up with, you know, also a big stew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big fans of stew up stew. here. Stew, we but like it's, food. It's fun to see how, how it all works. How about you guys? Yeah, well, um, you know, as somebody who was an English teacher for 14 years and uh, after I got my doctorate, I was in charge of an English language arts program and, and the ESL bilingual program in an entire school district. And now I'm teaching at the university. When, I, when the idea came for me to write a bunch of poems in this kid's voice, I started thinking as a teacher, well, what do teachers need from a book of middle grade poetry? What, what would they like to have? Yeah. You know, they've got to teach like all these, all these different forms and all these different like, you know, elements of prosody. So maybe I can have him like playing around with formal poetry because so, much, so many novels in verse are gonna be written in free verse. I was like, let me do something a little bit different. And so before I even knew it was gonna be a novel in verse, I, I had him experimenting with writing a sonnet, with writing, you know, different types of, of like more metered poetry and so forth. And there, in the, the collection was broken up into sections, an in initial chronological section that was a little more free verse. And and then sections where he's experimenting with different forms and writing about celebrations and people in his family and so forth. Um, and as I was writing all this, it, it was really, really a lot of fun. But you know, I handed off the rough draft to my editor, and he's like, "Well, this is you know a great this exercise in you know <laughs> in creating a textbook or something." But <laughs> But you oh, you got to stop thinking about the teachers and thinking about the students, <laughs> clearly. Um, and, and then he was the one who showed me, look, there's obviously a narrative thread here, a, a, a story that wants to be told. Rearrange all this stuff in chronological order and let's take a look at it and see where the gaps are and start filling those in. Um, and he started making suggestions for changes to some of the poems or things for me to think about that would that were disrupting, you know, whatever form the poem was being written in. So ha some of the poems are now like weird fusions of an original like formal poem mm. and then some like free verse elements. Um, I'm very happy with the, the final thing, but you know, when you go into it thinking, oh, I want to make something you know, that has utility for teachers, um, it doesn't always turn out quite the way yeah. um, <laughs> students are going to be happy with. And, and I think this is we we've we've found a place in the middle that is going to be exciting and fun and meaningful and that for students it will resonate with them, be a mirror for Latinx kids, be a window into Mexican American culture for others, but that also teachers will be like, oh, there's a sonnet in this book. That's awesome. Yeah, the war I, th I think the warning is always like, you can't, the moment you start writing for the adults, and if you're a children's author yep. or yeah. a YA author, the moment you start considering what the adults are going to think, say, you're a goner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. What do you think? Now, you're the editor, so I'm really feeling like, wowza. <laughs> Wasn't that great an editor? No. Um, <laughs> no I, the I truth comes out. out. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, this no. is my route into writing. <laughs> I wasn't a good line editor. I'm not incredibly detail-oriented that way. I'm much better, and I teach writing, too. So I've always been on kind of different sides. I've been a writing student, a writing teacher, a writer, an editor. So I sort of know how all those different places feel. So I think it gives me a fluidity of, you know, with drafts and having that conversation with your editor, I, I really never attach myself to whatever draft it is, and I know that it's going to change. I want it to change. I want to hear that other input. I'm actually a really linear writer, so I can get a little constrained. Like, I almost wish I could kind of jump around here and jump around there. So I, I often give myself some kind of limit in my writing, like the diary format or a point of view that I can kind of come up against as a, as a problem. Um, like, how do I tell a whole story in a diary? And will people be OK with me taking the leap, um, the main character kind of maybe filling out more of a narrative in the diary um, that maybe a 12-year-old would actually write in their diary. And so I do, there were times where I knew I was going to make that leap. But then there were times where I really had to, and then, you know, just through drafts, like, that's too much. You're really writing something else. You're not, you're not writing a, a diary entry anymore. But I like to have those walls to kind of hit against and, it, you know, and then make choices yeah. about them. Yeah, Here, I, I feel like I go back into my life as a oh, Yeah. Like, you can give me the, the linear parts, and I'll, I'll give you my jumping around parts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. After the panel, we'll do that. <laughs> the the consciousness transfer machine is in back. <laughs> Stop you.
<laughs> I feel like I go back into my teaching life. Um, for Mercy, I did that. And I, I feel like people ask you, like, what did you do before you were a writer and things like that? And I feel like everything you've done in your whole life makes you a writer. I don't know if you it's feel true. that way, but I yeah. feel like it all um, cooks into the person yeah. who creates. Um, all right, because we're here, certainly, um, in honor of We Need Diverse Books, I want to talk about how we write the nuanced stories of our communities. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about how we talk about the difficulties um, for kids in our communities and also the, both the, the hardship, the less flattering parts of our communities. Like, how is it that you approach that in your work? And I'm going to give you a break, Tiffany, because yeah, she's like, I could feel the terror coming off the It's coming right there. Let me think. So I'm, I'm going to put Emily on the spot this time. Yeah. I know. You see, they feel so bad for you. I think it's really a matter of being honest. Mm. Um, I think it's that, you know, I, I feel like when I... I've, I've, I've considered myself a storyteller for pretty much most of my life. And you know, when you, when you first start out your, your early novels, you're trying to, you try to write these like perfect characters who are, who are like the Disney-fied version of, <laughs> you know, maybe yourself or, or some, some imagining in your head of like that perfect unicorn human who does everything exactly right. right. Yeah. And that's not actually interesting to read. And as you develop as a writer, for, for me, it was about challenging myself to put the faults on the page, to find those flaws, to examine them and, and see how they actually make us more human and more interesting, um, and to put mistakes on the page. And then, and then kind of like I was saying earlier about how it took me so long to find the character for The Astonishing Color of After, I had to be willing to delve into things that were difficult to talk about and think about. Um, I, and the, the ugly parts of my experiences growing up, not just the fun things, but you know, like, um, dealing with microaggressions and dealing with never feeling like enough, never feeling Asian enough, never feeling American enough. And I think it just really became about capturing that truth as respectfully as possible. And also doing my due diligence because we inevitably all hold our own biases. And yeah. so I, I interviewed a lot of people to write uh, the Astonishing Color of After. I, I generally interview a lot of people for anything that I write to try to understand things from all sorts of different sides, to try to understand where my brain might be fixated on something because of how I was raised or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's really wise, especially, and I know this is the, the incredibly, The Astonishing Color of After is a debut novel, which is just yeah. a glorious, gorgeous thing. debut. It's just too. glorious <laughs> achievement. Thank you. Um, but I very much, hear that notion of humility when we approach our work and that we can get things wrong um, ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, about our own communities mm -hmm. even. So um, it's funny because it's such a struggle right now in our community at large in publishing, right? Yeah. Who gets mm -hmm. to write what, who's, but you know, we're all being held to that standard. Even we are holding ourselves to No, I think um, um, it was Daniel Jose Oldham that who's, comment I read a couple years ago and they were talking about diversity, he goes, I look forward to the, the day when we don't have to use the word diversity anymore, when, when work just reflects reality. And so um, when I set out to write about a Mexican American boy in the Mexican American community in the, the Valley, it was really important to me to be honest and, and reflect the world as it truly is. I mean, obviously it's a fictionalized version of things, but, um, and as the title suggests, they call me Huero. For those of you who are not familiar with Mexican Spanish, Huero means a white-coated, light-skinned uh, Mexican-American. Um, and at the core of the book is Huero's coming to realize that as the most light-skinned person in his family, he is the most privileged of the family. Um, and and like, you know, pushing back against that the way any 12 year old kid would because he also feels part of a community that's a community of color. 
And so even though he is a white Latino, he belongs to a community of color. And so he's in this weird liminal space um, where, when, for example, when um, his sister Teresa, who's a basketball player, her team gets to go away um, as part of the champions to a, a, a faraway town in another part of Texas that is uh, not as brown as South Texas, as you guys will undoubtedly realize Texas um, has many spots that are redder and whiter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, the fans of the opposing team start with a chant that was just basically ripped from the headlines of, you know, go back to Mexico, build that wall. And so suddenly Guero, who is often singled out for being light-skinned and, and red-haired and with colored eyes and freckles and stuff like that, suddenly has to, suddenly is definitely part of this, this solidarity that comes, you know, from being attacked as a community. Um, and at that moment, he even though he isn't, strictly speaking, a child of color, he is a child of color because he's part of a community of color. And it's this, that, that weird, uh, um, you know, nepantla, as Gloria Ansaldúa called it, that liminal space that in between, where your identity is neither one nor the other. Um, you, you know, when it's convenient for certain people, you can be seen as white, but the minute you're, you're your Latina identity comes to the forefront, you're no longer white. And th I wanted to grapple with that. And so to show the colorism within his own community, the way he's both treated better and sometimes, um, you know, hated upon for being light skinned, and also like the way his community is having to grapple with what's being pushed on them in 2019. Yeah, I really understand that idea of being in between um, and not really knowing what community you belong in, um, and that's something I, I try to bring to all my work, and my mother it was born here, and she's Jewish, and my father was born in India, and he's Hindu. Um, and so I really struggled with The Night Diary because I was writing a girl um, who, first of all, went through the partition in 1947, and I did not um, go through that. Um, so of course I talked to a lot of people and I talked to my father, which was an incredible opportunity to be able to talk to him about, you know, I would sit down and say, okay, dad, you know, everything you remember, all the little details that you think aren't important, tell me. Um, but then I talked to a lot of family members and I listened to a lot of oral testimonies um, collected in books and online. Um, but I, I did ask myself the question, Am I supposed to write, can I write this? Is this too much of a leap? And I come from an interfaith family, but my main character is Hindu and Muslim because I wanted her to um, ask a lot of questions about why those groups were in uh, conflict during that time. So I wanted her to really, when her country is being torn apart and com her community is being torn apart and she has these multiple identities, where does she belong? And I certainly could relate to it in a very, a deeply personal level because I'm, I've, my whole life I feel like I've been managing multiple identities and asking the question, where do I belong? And I've, I've found that it really has become my muse. It's really, um, really interesting, rich, complicated place to live, kind of in between. So I put that sort of in between in all of my characters and all of my work, but it's gonna manifest itself differently. But I do look for that place, where can I truly, personally, deeply connect to this story? And then it's gonna blossom and have a life of its own. And then when I am going more outside of myself, I sort of, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm writing more outside of myself now. What do I need? What kind of help do I need? What kind of research do I need to do? Um, how do I sort of respect this decision in this moment in the book? So. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the character Monday, she, uh, so the book, if some of you don't know, the book takes place here in, uh, in DC, in Southeast DC specifically. And the character Monday lives in a community called Edboro. Now, Edboro actually, if you read context clues and you're from here, Edboro is actually a community called Berry Farms. Berry Farms is, or was, a notorious housing project that was at some point saturated with crime and has been recently sold off to developers to basically wipe out an entire community and rebuild. So it's gentrification like, you know, on speed dial. Um, on speed, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> can't, really call, can't really call gentrification, but you kind of can. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when I was first writing Monday's Not Coming, 
uh, there was a lot of protests, a lot of activists, a lot of people trying to, you know, stop this development from happening, stopping people from evicting an entire community that's been there since the land was first bought for free slaves. So that was literally the only thing in this book that I had changed. I only changed that. I only changed the name of Berry Farms to Edboro to basically kind of not put any more spotlight and any negative sort of spotlight onto the community. Um, and I didn't want to taint, you know, what they were trying to do as well too. And that's sort of like, you know, one of the harder parts about writing about quote unquote rough areas like project houses. Because when, you, when people hear the projects, they immediately think like the hood. And that's never been my, you know, initial thought. When I think of, you know, housing projects stuff like that, I think of communities, I think of families. Like some of my favorite memories have been at my aunt's house. So there is very a delicate balance between per perpetuating stereotypes and telling the truth mm -hmm. and actually diving through that truth and seeing kind of like the color and the beauty of a community like that. Like right now, this day, there are only three families left in Berry Farms out of 444, like almost like 500 families, mm -hmm. which is insane. And that was something that I also had to grapple with in terms of while writing this book as well too, is like knowing that, you know, someone's gonna read this book next year and not know what the hell Berry Farms was even, right. was. So there was really much a delicate balance of that. And also the balance of like, you know, we weren't loud enough when all this was happening. Like, we didn't have people like say like, no, this is wrong. You cannot evict all these families and displace them. Like this is wrong. And that's one of the things that, you know, we as a black community, we tend to be very private about things. You know, we don't like to talk about like the ugly. We like to deal with it in our own ways in a lot of ways. And so I think that that was something that I also wanted to bring to the forefront as well too, is like talk about the fact that, you know, when things are going bad, like we are dealing with a lot of mental health issues and we can't just erase it by, you know, praying about it. We should talk to people about it. We should raise our voices about it. So I think that that was something that I, and I knew that I was probably gonna get a lot of slack for it in a way, because um, I was you know, sort of exposing a little bit of dirty laundry at the same time. Um, but I thought it was important. And so you know, I'll take the hits if I know that it's gonna help our community heal yeah. and sort of erase sort of the stereotypes of what housing projects could be like as well too. I feel the, the weight of the dirty laundry thing too when I'm writing about sometimes machismo or uh, yeah. family violence, like those kinds of things I feel like. Um, but I'm with Emily and, and with all of you, just like the push of the truth feels like more urgent to me. Yeah. So let's talk about um, writing really hard emotional truths for children because that takes a lot of thinking. Yeah. Right? It takes a lot of thinking and it takes a lot of consideration of who the children are, how old they are, like all of that. What do you, what do you think? How, how do you approach that? Because I mean, think of the subjects that we have here, right? Yeah. We have um, adults murdering each other. We have a mom's suicide. We have the loss of a friend. Um, we have grappling with like deep identity. Who am I yeah. if I don't look like my family, who am I? So how do we write these painful things? What are the kinds of questions you ask yourself when you're gonna write something that's, that's violent, that's hard, that's true? Uh, I typically, so I'm kind of known for uh, <laughs> gut punching people uh, with my stories, um, to put it very lightly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, because I always, I feel that we grossly underestimate what kids can handle as far as pain, and as far as like what they are able to you know, absorb. But at the end of the day, you know, I feel like it's more urgent for us to do that. When I think of writing stories, I wanna write raw stories. I wanna write stories that really like, you know, stick with you. Like you always remember the first time you got hit. I mean, I do. So <laughs> I feel like that's something that 
you remember that story. You don't want that story to really like leave the person's head. Mm -hmm. I want my stories to be raw. I want the plot twist to be forever in all of my books so that kids remember those lessons. So that in a couple years when kids are in voting booths, I want them to be thinking and they have to vote on like a proposition that's going to erase an entire community. Mm -hmm. I want them to remember Monday and Berry Farms and everything that happened in Monday's Not Coming. So I personally feel like I don't, not that I don't care, about how emotionally triggering the book could be, but I also feel like there's an urgency to fix other things that matter more than anything else. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah. Totally. I, I agree with, I think it's, it's really dangerous to, to start off going, oh, I, I need to protect the kids because the kids are grappling with stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember when I was that age and the kinds of stuff that I had to grapple with and I remember what it was like for my dad to abandon us and like the, the devastation you feel after that. Um, and so like I deliberately try to tap into the things, like I just feel, especially when writing for, you know, like upper middle grade and YA, if, if, there, if, if writing the book, if I do not break down weeping several times writing the book, then I'm not doing my job because I, I need mm -hmm. to tap into something that's so raw and vibrant that I can put it across. And then, you know, then you, you layer a little bit of protection for the kids so that they're not being, you know, slammed with it like so brutally, but you want that emotion to be there because they can tell the difference. They know when you're just writing something superficially to get a paycheck and, and they get on the bestseller list or when you're writing something that is meaningful and you're trying to tr transmit your own um, deeply felt um, trauma or emotion or joy or whatever the emotion happens to be, right, um, to them. And uh, when a lot of people, uh, I remember Ana Mariano um, adding me on Twitter because she was wrapping up the book and she loved it, loved it, loved it, and she read the book about the boy's dog. And she was like, why would you do this to me? <laughs> but because every child experiences the death of a pet. And it's a lot of times for kids, it's the very first time that they, that they have to grapple with that. And I remember my dog dying when I was seven and how I was just, I, I, was, I was so hurt and so like, you know, you're being faced with this darkness that exists all around you um, and you're not ready for it, but the world thrusts it on you. And I think it's kind of like, you know, incumbent on us to be the person that holds the kid's hand and says, look, there's darkness, you need to see it, but I'm gonna walk with you mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna look at it together so that you, you know that, that you're not alone in this. And uh, if we can put that across, I think it's really important. And how about, how about with yours, Emily? Because it, you know, it deals with the parental suicide. So, and I'm, I'm thinking about the word triggers, I'm thinking of all of those things. Like, how did you, did, what were you thinking about when you were writing those scenes and that reality? Like, were you thinking about the reader or were you completely immersed in story? How did, how did you do that? It's tricky because I, when I sat down in front of the yet again blank screen, January 2nd, 2015, um, <laughs> literally rewriting the book from scratch again, I, I didn't know what I was setting out to write. And um, the opening pages of the book poured out of me. I always talk about how it was kind of like a fugue state. And I've, I think I've like hammered home the point now that I rewrite things over and over and over again. Those opening pages are like the only pages in the book that have been so preserved since that first yeah. draft. And in the, in the opening, it, it starts with Lee, um, you know, seeing that her mother has died by suicide. And I, I, did, I honestly did not set out to write a book about suicide or a book about depression, but I had lost my aunt to suicide the year before and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And kind of going back to what you were saying with like kids dealing with grief, the, the first time I lost someone, I was eight years old. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather passed away like eight days before my birthday and my parents didn't tell me for a whole month Oh uh, because they didn't want to ruin my birthday. And then they also said, but you don't need to be upset when they finally told me. So it was always, <laughs> this is a pattern in my family. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> they just deal with death in this really weird way. When my, when my childhood dog passed away, which was um, just a handful of years ago, my parents also like didn't tell me until our like nightly phone call because I'm one of those people who calls my parents every day. So like at night I call them and they're oh, like, oh, like this, like this. 
I'm like one of those codependent only children <laughs> who like, anyway, we can, that's another story. Uh, and so like they, they didn't tell me until nighttime that like they had taken my, my dog to be put down that morning. And when I found out that my aunt died, it was again like, like at midnight, I called my, I was like, oh crap, I gotta call my parents, they're gonna be going to bed soon. And my dad let me go through my whole ramble of all the mundane things happening in my life before he was like, there's some sad news, your aunt passed this morning. And I was like, WTF, yeah. like, like how is this family so unhealthy about grief? And then, and then they did the whole song and dance of like, you don't need to burden yourself. And I was like, what's wrong with you? Like of all my extended family members, yeah. she's the one that I actually felt the closest to. And so it was this, for me, when I was writing, sorry, this is a long winded answer. <laughs> so yeah. when, I was, when I was writing, it was like, I was trying to grapple with a lot of things. I was trying to grapple with all these things that I'd sort of shelved, it took me until I got to college to understand that the way I had grown up was abnormal. That the way depression takes up so much space in a house, that, that the things that were my concerns as I was growing up were not the concerns of m many other kids around me. Mm -hmm. And so when I was writing the book, the first draft was really me writing purely for myself. And it was as I, delved into, it took me until draft three to be like, oh, I gotta like look depression head on. I gotta talk about suicide. I gotta talk about how it affects not just one person, but the whole family. Mm -hmm. and, and then it became this thing where I had to carefully carve away and say, what things do I wanna show on the page? What things do I wanna protect readers from? Especially readers who are fellow suicide loss survivors. Um, you know, I, I'm fully aware that for some people it's gonna be too triggering of a book to read. Yeah. And, and others, many, many suicide loss survivors have reached out to me to say that they really needed a book like that. And so I, I think it's, it is a really tricky thing to navigate, to, to figure out like what, what kind of language um, might be poetic but is actually damaging. And what, what kind of things are actually important to explore to allow for that safe space. Like when I wasn't given the chance to grieve for my grandfather when I was eight, I found my solace in, in books where, you know, like I read Where the Red Fern Grows and then sobbed my eyes out because it was a, spa a safe space to grieve over the death of these wonderful dogs. And I needed to have that space. So I, I hope that I can offer a safe space to somebody who needs something fictional to cry about in order to work out their real life feelings. And Vera. <laughs> I'm thinking also, Vera, that you peel back a window into adults, the, the violence that adults perpetrate on each other yeah. in the full sight of children. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was very difficult. And, you know, I would hear stories and look at, you know, pictures taken of the time. I mean, um, there were, you know, trains that were intercepted going in both directions um, where they would be, you know, trains would be stopped by rioters and everybody would get out or get in and there would be this horrible fight. and. And then there would be, trains would pull up in stations filled with corpses um, during the partition. So if you talk to anybody who's been through this time and you mention the trains, that's, everybody knows what the trains mean. You just have to say the trains. Um, my father's family got on a train and made it safely over um, the border, but so many people did not. So I had to figure out how I write something for young people to see the truth of this history. I mean, it's a living history still. My, my father's in his 80s and, and most people, and he was nine when he went through this, so most people who went through um, the partition are in their 80s and 90s and older and, and then we're not going to have these people alive to tell their stories anymore. So I think people of my generation from partition survivors really uh, feel this urgency. I mean, I definitely felt an urgency to capture this history in the way that I could and people are doing it in different ways um, just to make sure to capture it. But the truth of the history is so bloody and so um, unimaginable 
that um, you know, I wanted to have some of that truth in the story, but you know, I'm also a parent, and I felt like, um, how, you know, what, what can kids handle? And I think that they can handle a lot, but I also didn't want to sort of interrupt the experience of learning about this history, making it too traumatic. Because the, the raw history is, you can't even, you can't mm -hmm. even process it. Um, and I would sit with tears streaming down my face looking at pictures or feel sick sometimes. Um, but then I would just take that feeling and, and see, you know, how can I kind of match all those things, the truth of the character, the truth of their story, pulling in a number of different stories that I researched. And there was some protection. I mean, I was protecting the young reader at certain times. Um, and I, I think the, you, the yours is a middle grade novel, yeah, as opposed yeah. to YA. I write across sure. those uh, age groups, too. And there are slightly different considerations yes. for yeah. each yeah. one. And I think someone at 17 isn't someone at 11, right. right? So we modulate, we have to modulate that. So because I have consideration for you folks, I'm not gonna leave you on this sad place. <laughs> so I, I, this is a joyous day, friends, <laughs> right? So I think now we talk fun things. So I am just interested in, um, I, I don't know about you, but what a career this is, right? What a journey. I had no idea when I decided that I wanted to be a writer or try. I really, really had no idea. So I'm curious, like, what has surprised you about being <laughs> an author? What has delighted you? And what has been maybe shocking in not such a good way? <laughs> what do you think? I mean, this could be a free for all. We're gonna, we have access to grind right here, people. No, like, what, what, what do you think? What has delighted you? What has surprised you? Um, so when I was growing up, I honestly thought that, you know, writers were just like very solo careers. Like, you know, you're just, you know, you're by yourself. So I've actually been so surprised by how many people I've actually had to talk to. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, for, for those who like really know me, like I'm actually like, still like quite shy, so this is like my worst nightmare. But, <laughs> but like, yeah, I'm actually really surprised, but also delighted by the fact that I do get to go and, you know, tour around and go do school visits and talk to kids. And, you know, kids, they'll, they'll keep you humble. Like, mm. they, you know, yeah. you know, bless their hearts. <laughs> but yeah, I've always been like, I'm so surprised by how many people I got to talk to and how many uh, kids I got to talk to, how many prisons I've got a chance to visit and like the young men in there and like talking to them and hearing their stories. Because um, I honestly, by now, I th really thought I was going to be like the old woman by the sea. Like I really just was like, I was, I had my shack ready. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I had to talk to anyone. I definitely didn't think I had to be on Twitter and like have to like interact and just, you know, it's just like, pe like I don't really do people. So it was, <laughs> so that has been like, you know, a joyous surprise, I would say. <laughs> what surprised you, Miss Debut? Tell me, what has surprised you? I, I'm perpetually surprised all over again when I'm signing books and an Asian American reader comes up to me and says, I didn't realize we could do this. And, and says that like, you're the first Asian author I've ever met. And every single time I'm like, bowled over by that. Yeah. And like I've, I did a school visit um, at my own middle school a few months ago. And there was this one Asian American girl who came up to me and was like in tears. And I was like, what, are you okay? Like what's going on? <laughs> and she was like, you're like a writer. You're like the real deal. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is like a, 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 a lot. Yeah, and, and that's been like really amazing and also really depressing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that's, that's true. That's an interesting thing that yeah. there are surprises that are both really joyous and really sad yeah. in yeah. publishing. Yeah. I was sad to find out how few books um, were written by or about people of color. And, right. and I mean, we're improving every year, but that's a, that's a really sad reality when you look out at our country and see who's here and, and the vibrancy of, of the country. What do you think, And I, I co-sign everything that Tiffany and Emily just said. Um, the other thing that really surprises me, though, that I guess I wasn't really prepared for, was 
how incredibly rewarding and edifying it would be to be part of a community of writers. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the Latinx caucus, as Daniel <laughs> Jose Older calls us, the, the larger community of writers of color, it's, they welcome you with open arms, they make you feel like just another sibling and part of this really, really big family. Um, and <laughs> they're people that you can commiserate about, so commiserate <laughs> with about these very things, right? Um, so it's really nice to, to have that network and to have each other's backs and um, to go into, you know, to be on, on a panel, whatever, and see one of your friends in the audience and know that, that, that there's that solidarity and that, that's something really special. Yeah, it is a nice surprise. I found that it just being um, welcomed in so many writing communities, and particularly with this book in the South Asian writing community. I think that that has been incredibly joyous for me, and in some ways healing, because I wasn't sure if I was like allowed being half Indian, you know? And so that halfness um, has been, been hard for me to figure out, and then I've just been so, welcomed and, and validated, and, and I just feel like it's, it's okay to be me. And so that has been oh, really surprising and wonderful. Yeah. I've enjoyed um, the honor of just being with people who live in their imagination. Yeah. There's a, a beautiful gift in that, yeah. um, in working with adults who still live in the world of, of pretend and what if, and who can still remember so clearly what it is to be a child. I love that. And I'm getting ready to wrap up, and what I want to say to all of you is this, that it has been such an honor to be on this stage with you. And I'm so excited to be writing books in the time of Tiffany and Emily and David and Vera. And I just can't wait to see what else you have inside of you. So if there are, I think we're ready. Oh, if we have questions, we can um, ask them now. There's I see one over here. Would you be willing to stand up and give us your question? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh huh. How did you feel when you were writing the books? Anyone want to feel that one? My book is a sad book, so I mean, you were. <laughs> I mean, I, I cried on every every draft. <laughs> I'm also just like like prone to crying, but <laughs> yeah. Um, I was a little excited because this was. I mean, you know, other than like you know messing with people's heads, which you know that's exciting. Um, <laughs> I think I was really excited because this book takes place like here in DC, which is very much my second home. And so I was excited to bring a lot of DC subculture to the page. Like I was talking to like, I was talking about go-go music, which a lot of people don't know. And I was, I got a chance to like use DC slang. So I was calling people Bamas. That's like a career <laughs> high. And, like, and you know, I was telling people about chicken and mambo sauce. So it was like really like, that was a high for me to, actually how many people are here from Southeast DC? Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, hey guys. <laughs> So at the end of the day, like I was writing for them. I was writing for kids to see themselves on the page too. And you know, I, even though I'm not from here, I love it here as well too. Yeah. Um, so that was actually one of the best things, how I felt, it was amazing. But you went to school here, you went to Yes, Howard, yes, so you, you know, so I, I, I technically, I'm sort of from here, but sort of. Where but, are you from before here? I'm Brooklyn. Ah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants we're, to own Brooklyn. So, I'm so a much. queen girl, and we don't get enough love. I'm just saying, blushing. <laughs> you see, nobody. <laughs> I tried to like reel it in, but it was too late. <laughs> Other questions? Other questions? Anyone else? Yes. Stand up and, and give it. Oh, this group is lively. Oh God. How do we end books? 
That's a chuffy. <laughs> I just, noticed I just she stopped. picked you. <laughs> like, that's enough of this. <laughs> Quick epigraph, real short poem, boom, let's go. Well, well, well let like me ask you this. I'm going to piggyback yeah. on yours. Did, is the ending that we read in the actual book, it, was that your first ending? Is that how you originally ended it? No. No, no. Right. It, endings are so hard. I mean, the first one tends to be that sort of wrap it up and stop. I just have to stop. Um, <laughs> and then you just kind of go back again and again. It's, it's so hard to get right. I, I really struggle with endings. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, Tiffany's like, knife, rent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's terrible up here. Gee, you should put her in your novel. You need a character That's named Tiffany. Emily. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> so. Both of my books um, are loosely inspired by real cases. So Monday's Not Coming was inspired by two real cases oh, um, of happenings that happened. And particularly if you're from DC, you remember the Benita Jacks case. That was very much something that happened here um, only, oh, only a decade ago. So the endings are sort of already, I already have them. Like when people are like, you know, how do you come up with these crazy books? I'm like, actually, here's the article. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making up anything. Um, so I guess that's where I sort of come to the conclusions of like the endings of books is like using the real, using the real cases and trying to find a way to make sense of the trauma and make sense of the tragedy by laying out as much causes and effects of how things happen. Because um, I want you guys particularly to realize like everything, you know, no one is born bad. Everyone is grown and developed out of something. And I want to, you to see all those elements. I want you to see how gentrification, how the crack epidemic, how poverty, how everything actually affects how someone grows and, then their, and their choices that they eventually make. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions? There's one really um, there far one in the back by the in camera. The middle? Where? You see it by the camera? Oh, yes. Uh, my question is directed the mic. <laughs> Put the mic up. Thank you. <laughs> my question is directed toward Tiffany. Is there a specific reason why um, you chose to talk about Monday being a child who was being abused by her family? Because that actually happened to the girls in the inspired stories. So that was the real reason why I chose to talk about that trauma and talk about where that trauma root was rooted from as well too. Okay. One more? There's some girls way in the back by the camera. Way in the back in the white? Yeah, I, I, I actually uh -oh. eventually will need glasses. Okay. Whoever stood up first gets to ask. <laughs> That's the way it works. Don't wait to her. Um, hi, um, I was wondering for Miss Emily, um, how did your family react to you talking about the trauma that you went through um, when you were younger Ooh. in the book? How did they react to your books in general? That's good. So my, <laughs> my parents haven't finished reading yet. <laughs> and, that is hilarious. And so, but I did, I did sit down, sit down with them when we sold the book, <laughs> to be like, this is coming out. <laughs> you can't do anything about it. It's um, up. I, I sort of feel like um, my family is maybe a little, I'm like, are they watching this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are I, live streaming. I, <laughs> I think my family is probably a little unprepared for how honest I like to be in my work. You know, like one time I wrote a short story about someone with bad breath and my mom was like, people are gonna think you have bad breath. <laughs> if she only knew that that's the smallest problem. And, and so, but I did, I did feel I wanted to be respectful. So I did reach out to my cousins and I did reach out to my parents and say, this is, this is something I'm writing about. And, and I know that you feel very trapped by the stigma and you don't want people to know that there's depression in our family and you don't, you don't want people to see us in that, that light that you cast upon this entire topic and, and I want to be able to talk about it. And so it started with this, you know, like growing up my, my parents were always like, don't let people know that there's depression in your family um, because they'll look at you differently. And, 
And I always really pushed against that. I always felt like it was something that we needed to, you know, like depression, any mental illness, it's a, it's a health problem, you know? Like somebody who has diabetes needs insulin, maybe someone who has depression needs more serotonin. And so we need to talk about these things the same way we can talk about other health issues mm -hmm. so that the stigma doesn't cause people to do more damage to themselves, to, to feel like they have to hide and they can't live out there freely. And so, so I've always been more vocal than my family wanted me to be about it. And then when I wrote this book, I, I had to sort of sit my parents down and be like, how much are you willing to let me talk about? And that's been one of the amazing gifts of this journey is that my parents have started to open up more oh, about it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And and yeah. and my mom has said to me too that like one day I also want to write about our family. Like it is a goal. Oh, my yeah. mom is also a writer. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. That's cool. yeah. So that's been my mom is a creative nonfiction writer, so I feel like through her lens it would be it would be like really especially important. And um, so yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's complicated. They, we'll see, I'll, I'll report back to you when they actually finish the book. We, we want the transcripts of the calls. With <laughs> um, all right, if we can give these wonderful authors. When we selected the topic, read, discover, grow, we had no idea how much we would grow in such a short time. Thank you again, all of you. I took so many notes, um, the nuanced stories of our communities, uh, the challenges of perpetuating stereotypes or telling the truth. Uh, I, I just could go on forever, and I just, I mean, I think this has just been such a, a wonderful symposium, and I, I really want to thank the Library of Congress for partnering with us and, and, and bringing um, your voices, your wonderful voices, and also uh, bringing in adults, students, educators, librarians, and, um, and, and you, you guys, especially the students, ask such wonderful questions. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a short break, uh, and I mean short, uh, 15 minutes. Um, there is coffee and light refreshments in the Whittall Pavilion next door, except you can't bring it back in here. So you have to eat it out there. <laughs> it, we have rules, it's a library. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing is that the book sales will continue, okay? So help yourself there.
I know I'm loud. I'm from Brooklyn. I am loud. Everybody, come on in. <laughs> Thank you, kids, for coming. I actually tried to bribe my kids to come by telling them they'd miss school, and they went to school. <laughs> That's why I'm so glad to see you guys. Okay, so welcome everyone to the fourth anniversary of the Walter Awards. We are grateful. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, my name is Ellen O. I am the CEO, co-founder. Thank you. Right. Will, will you guys come home with me and do this every day? I love you guys. Um, we are grateful and honored to be able to partner with the Library of Congress for the past four years and present our awards in this beautiful and historic building. This year is also the five-year anniversary of the founding of We Need Diverse Books. The first tweet, yeah. The, the first tweet went uh, with the hashtag and it went out on April 24th, 2014, and WNDB incorporated in July of that year. So it's been five years, five challenging years that have turned my hair completely gray like Barack Obama in his last term of president. <laughs> that have left me with two eye twitches on either side, like one twitch this way and then this one twitches that way. And, People, random strangers, think I'm winking at them. <laughs> but you know, trying to change the status quo has never been an easy feat. When we started out as a hashtag, none of us knew that we would end up building a nonprofit organization from scratch and develop core programming dedicated to help fix the problems that we were raising awareness of. Many of my teammates, teammates who started out with me five years ago, burned out, utterly exhausted by all that we were trying to achieve. Fortunately, many others stepped up and kept WNDB running. And I would like to take a moment to recognize them. Danielle Clayton, our COO, stand up. <laughs> Judy Schricker. Judy, our CFO, stand up wherever you, are you hiding? Okay. And then, of course, Carolyn Richmond, our program director. I gotta be honest, I don't think I would have made it this far without them. I probably would have been a hermit on some, you know, some eye twitchy hermit on a remote island. <laughs> you know, where no one has ever heard of Twitter or Facebook or internet trolls and sipping coconut milk and, wait a minute, this sounds really good. Why did you keep me? No, but what a difference five years make. We've given 16 Walter grants for aspiring writers and illustrators, of which five have gone on to get their own book deals. In fact, the most famous one is somebody called Angie Thomas for a book. She won our inaugural Walter Grant for a little book called The Hate You Give that has sat on the New York Times bestsellers list for over 106 weeks, guys. That is phenomenal. We've given out 33 internship grants for college students to become publishing interns. And 21 of them have gotten full-time jobs in publishing. We've also provided 38 mentorships that connect promising writers, illustrators with seasoned professionals and given away over 14,000 books to schools nationwide. And we've published two amazing anthologies with Crown Books Penguins Ran Penguin Random House, our middle grade anthology Flying Lessons and Other Stories, and our YA anthology Fresh Ink, and this year, because every time I go to a school visit, they say, where are more anthologies? This year, we have another middle grade anthology called The Hero Next Door coming out, and I'm so excited. Now here's another little statistic. We had contests for new uh, unpublished writers in all three of our anthologies. And all three of them, our contest winners, have gone on to get their own book deal. Yeah. 
So I feel like we've truly accomplished so much in these past five years. Now, when we started We Need Diverse Books, our goal was a, a world in which children can see themselves in the pages of a book, right? What we now know is that it's not just about seeing ourselves. It's that it's just as important for everyone to see themselves. Everyone has to see themselves being told in the pages of a book. We have to read the stories of everyone. We have to fight stereotypes and bad representation and seek to empower and enrich our children's lives by teaching them to be empathetic. Now, children don't have the capacity, I mean, children, wait, I said that wrong. Children have the capacity for great empathy, but they're not born empathetic. They must learn it through education and real life experiences and books are a really important part of that learning experience. We need to give our kids books that accurately reflect the world that they live in so that they can read widely and diversely and meet new people, new worlds, and new friends through the pages of a book because they can then become the future that we are looking for. Which is why this award ceremony is just so very special. We celebrate the very best of the books that we need to see the most now. And I have to say, it's been amazing to see it grow. Our first year of the Walter Awards, we received only 50 submissions for consideration from publishers. This year, that number has jumped to 244 submissions. Yeah. Our judges had their work cut out for them. This is a change that we've been hoping to see. And now WNDB has a new executive director with over 20 years of experience in nonprofit leadership, program development, and resource development to help build an even stronger future for this wonderful organization that we all support and believe in. I'm so proud to introduce you to our executive director and the person who has stopped me from twitching in both eyes, Nicole Johnson. Oh my gosh, good morning everybody. Um, Ellen, thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of this dynamic movement to ensure that every child in America can see themselves in a book. Um, yesterday and today I've been very fortunate to be able to meet my heroes. Um, authors, illustrators, publishers, educators, and librarians who write or promote the books that change children's lives. I come to this work with a background in youth development. Um, over the years, I have witnessed the emotion a young child or a teenager expresses when they connect with a book. Sometimes they cry, sometimes they laughed, um, but they always had something to think about um, and a way to understand themselves and the world around them. Um, the authors we celebrate today are mastering the art of storytelling. They are signaling to children and teens across the country, I see you. My task in these few minutes um, is to accomplish a couple things. Um, is to offer acknowledgments to the team of volunteers and partners who made this event possible. Um, first, the many WNDB volunteers who are working in the registration area and behind the scenes to think, keep things moving today. Thank you so much for dedicating your time to us year after year. We have many folks that have returned year after year. And we are also grateful um, to those who uh, served on the Walters Committee uh, and the judging committee um, for this event. Um, so first off, I want to ask these folks to stand. So uh, Kathy and Terry, our co-directors, would you guys stand and wave to the audience? Yes, I'm asking you to stand. <laughs> uh, the judging committee, uh, led by its chair, Maria. And members, Lee, Loretta, Julia, Candice, Kathy, and John. You guys want to stand up? <laughs> These individuals started working the day after our 2018 awards ceremony. They dedicated many hours to designing this event, uh, connecting with publishers, reading and discussing each submission, resulting in the winners and honorees that you see today. Um, we would also like to thank publishing partners, Penguin Random House, for donating copies of Flying Lessons and Fresh Ink to our student attendees. 
Uh, special thanks to Harper Collins for donating copies of the anniversary edition of Monster. 2019 marks the 20th anniversary of this groundbreaking work by Walter Dean Myers. The students attending will also receive copies of this book. Um, WNDB is celebrating. Yes, plus. <laughs> WNDB is celebrating its hour, because I'm part of the family now, our fourth year giving the Walter Awards and our fourth year partnering with the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress staff, we deeply appreciate the work that you all commit and the time and energy that you give to this event. You truly serve as a, as a partner, an equal partner in helping us to make this happen, so thank you. Um, and it is with my pleasure that I want to introduce um, a member of that team, um, Ms. Sherry rosenstein Werb. Sherry is the director of the Center for Learning, Literacy, and Engagement for the Library of Congress. She comes to the Library of Congress from the Smithsonian Institution, where for 10 years she was the director of education, outreach, and, the visit and visitor experience program at the National Museum of Natural History. National Museum of Natural History. She led the transformation of public engagement with the museum's exhibitions, collections, and experts. Before joining the Smithsonian, Sherry spent more than 17 years at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, where she served as the Director of Institutional Outreach, the Director of Education and Public Programs, and as a museum educator. Sherry is committed to broadening equity and access to scientific experiences for diverse audiences. Sherry, thank you so much to you and your team for making this possible. Please join me in welcoming Sherry. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. There's such great energy in this room today. Um, as I was walking in, I noticed some um, tags on the seats from Alice Steele Middle School, where my own two sons attended. So welcome to you all. Um, I'm here, actually, on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, who couldn't be with us here this morning. But I am pleased to add my voice to the chorus of voices welcoming you to the Library of Congress this morning. We're proud to have hosted this morning's symposium on diversity in children's literature, and also to be hosting this ceremony. Both events highlight and promote books that broaden our notions of diversity, engage us in meaningful conversations about them, and emphasize our desire for every child to see themselves in the pages of the book. To honor exemplary diverse books created by writers and illustrators from marginalized communities, we Need Diverse Books established the Walter Dean Myers Award for Outstanding Children's Literature, the Walters. As many of you know, Walter Dean Myers was a five-time winner of the Coretta Scott King Award and received two Newbery Honors. He was named the third National Ambassador for Young People's Literature by the Library of Congress, the Children's Book Council, and Every Child a Reader in 2012. Although Walter passed away in 2014, we remember him today and are delighted that the Walter Awards serve to celebrate him. It is my pleasure to introduce the MC for this morning's award ceremony, Linda Sue Park. <laughs> Linda Sue Park has been writing poems and stories since she was four years old. And her favorite thing to do as a child was read. She's the author of numerous novels, picture books, and poetry collections for children. Her work often uses historical settings and innovative forms to expand young readers' sense of the possibility. For example, her poetry collection, Tap Dancing on the Roof, Shijo, utilizes a Korean syllabic verse form to bring surprise and humor to everyday moments and objects. Park's novels for middle, middle grade and teen readers in, include Newberry Medalist, A Single Shard, When My Name Was Keoko, and A Long Walk to Water, as well as the Wing and Claw Fantasy Trilogy. Her newest picture book, which isn't even out yet, but due out this week, is Gondra's Treasure. It's really important um, to be addressing these um, diff uh, addressing difficult topics, um, but it's really especially good when you can have a playful way of engaging with these complicated um, personal topics. 
Um, this new book is a playful look at mixed race identity, which um, is a really exciting way of uh, connecting with young people. Linda Sue grew up at, outside Chicago and earned a BA at Stanford University, and she lives with her family in Western New York. Please join me in welcoming Linda Sue Park to the podium. Walter Dean. I got to know him as a colleague on the advisory board of SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. I considered him a mentor, not only about writing, but about the world and life, and especially life as a person of color. About 10 or 12 years ago, we had a conversation that led directly to me standing here today. We were talking about diversity in the children's book world long before WNDB was even a twinkle in Ellen's eye. <laughs> and I was flailing. I was flinging ideas around, wanting desperately to do something beyond my own writing, something to help change the industry. But I had no clue how to start. Walter Dean, Walter Dean. No, no, no. Walter Dean, Walter Dean. <laughs> He listened sympathetically while I rambled on and on. I wanted to provide scholarships to the NYU or the Columbia publishing programs, but how would I ever raise enough money for that? I wanted publishing professionals to go into high schools and community colleges and talk to young people, not about writing, but about careers in the book industry, editing, marketing, sales, publicity. I wanted to figure out a way to get more people of color and other diverse identities into the internship pipeline. I wanted to, that's it, Walter Dean said to me. That's the best idea. Well, those of you who knew Walter Dean will recall that his pronouncements were akin to hearing something in the voice of God. <laughs> so forth I went. He wasn't actually perfect. We had so many arguments about rap music, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but for the next few years, I talked about internships to anyone who would stand still long enough. And then one fateful day in 2014, Ellen asked me if I would like to work with WNDB. And I said, mm, yeah, but I got a condition. I want to work on internships. She said, oh, fine, we have it. we're going to have an internship program. <laughs> Sign me up. I have been honorary chair of the internship program committee since its inception. This will be the fifth year of the program. Our first WNDB interns received their grants in 2015. And uh, Ellen, we have given out 33 grants, but 22 of the internship grantees now have full-time jobs in children's publishing. That's more than just a drop in the bucket, right? That's at least a ripple. And because of my involvement with the internship committee, Caroline Richman and the Walter Wards committee have honored me with the invitation to host the ceremony today. I'm not going to stand here and say, we did it, Walter. And I actually don't think he's up there. I think he's out there. Right? But I will say, we're doing it, Walter. And thank you for your encouragement to me over all those years. Now I have the incredible honor and delight of it introducing Christopher Myers. The last name might sound familiar. <laughs> Chris's books have won Caldecott honors and Coretta Scott King honors and the Boston Globe Horn Book Honor. Widely acclaimed for his work with literature for young people, he's also an accomplished fine artist who has lectured and exhibited internationally. His practice can be divided into two categories, interventions in historical narratives and work crafted with artisans from around the globe, from places as disparate as Egypt, Vietnam, Indonesia, Brooklyn. Chris is also the creative director of the new imprint, Make Me a World, at Random House Children's Books, which is dedicated to exploring the vast possibilities of contemporary childhood. He makes his own clothes. <laughs> a few centuries ago, someone like Chris would have maybe been called a Renaissance man. Well, I say step aside, Da Vinci, because we got Chris Myers. <laughs>
Hi, y'all. It's, it's so good to hear so many sweet things said about my father, right? It's really, it's really nice. It's almost enough to make you forget some of the other things about him. <laughs> I'll tell you a little story. Uh, this is about five and a half years ago, maybe six. I was invited to go to Papua New Guinea. Um, which is just forever away. It's like nine plane rides. You have to go to Australia, then you have to go to a Port Moresby, which is like a little janky town, but it's the capital, but whatever. And then you go from there, I flew to another town called Alatau, and from there I got on a boat. And on this boat, I went from island to island to island. It's all, Papua New Guinea is all tiny, 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 tiny islands. Um, my father, said, and I quote, why are you going to Papua New Guinea, man? And I said, well, someone's playing for, paying for a plane ticket. He said, well, all right. I mean, if they're paying for the plane ticket. <laughs> I get to one of these tiny islands. I get off the boat that I'm on. And the people who are on this island are excited to see someone get off a boat who's not white, right? There's, they're brown people. They, they recognize game, recognize game. And there's a little bit of like, oh, hello. And I was like, hey, how you doing? So I'm sitting on this island in Papua New Guinea. Um, and I realized after walking around a little bit that there were no mirrors on the island. And there were no photos on the island. There was no electricity on the island. Every, all the houses are thatch, thatch huts on stilts. There's one school that is made of corrugated tin. In there, that, of course, because I am at core a book person, the books are all British colonial books, right? And so we're on this island with almost no images, right? There was one guy who had a photo of his grandfather. His grandfather had played soccer and therefore left the island and went to Port Moresby, and there was a photo of him on the soccer team, and that was stuck to the, the, the thatch roof side of the hut. So. I was struck by both the universality of our problems, right? That even in the, 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 the thatch roof huts of Anacostia or of Harlem or Brooklyn, we're still starving for images. And I was struck by the immediacy of what I could do. Um, and so I sat down with my, with my pad and my, and my ink and my, and my brushes and I did what I do everywhere. I said, you know, can I make some images? And I painted all the kids on this island, right? The island is, has got maybe 250 people. Of those 250 people, there's like 75 that are kids. So I, paint, I sat there and I just waited and the long line started. <laughs> and if you go to this island this day on the side of these statue roof huts, you will see also little paintings of these kids. As I was leaving the island, a guy named Edison, and that was, that was his name because, again, colonialism is a big thing. <laughs> um, really, I mean, these folks came out and they were wearing traditional garb from thousands of years. And dude introduced himself, the guy who spoke English on the island, said, hello, I'm Edison. I said, oh, all right, all right. <laughs> um, he said, thank you, and thank you for my family. And he, he kind of gestured at the rest of the island one of the other people who was on this boat with me said, is he like the father of everyone on the island? <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't quite know what to say, <clears throat> except that I, I, I was able to, you know, I wanted to communicate to the people on the boat with me, because those are the people who needed some education, that there are family structures beyond what you may know. This here is part of a family. What you guys are to the work that we are doing is family. And this is a special, special moment in the Library of Congress to be here with family. This is that unorthodox family structure that we are talking about. And like all families, we've got characters and we've got conflict. <laughs> we've got unexpected guest stars and we've got <laughs> can't get right cousins. <laughs> Tiger moms, <laughs> aunts with secret lives, Linda Sue, <laughs> S 
slacker nephews and cool uncles. Jason, Jason the cool uncle for everybody, right? <laughs> and we will fight amongst ourselves like all the good unorthodox families that I know. And as we all see that we have goals, we want to change the industry, we want to change the lives of the children that we meet, the children that we, we so desperately care about, and we're going, to, we're going to have conflict in that mission. And I think that five years in is a good time to note that. And to note that, you know, oftentimes, I, you know, I've been part of these conversations for a long time. I remember Pop talking to me about, man, Linda Sue, she's got her head on. She's doing, she's, th she's thinking about it. She's really doing it. She's thinking outside of, of, of her just her books, and she's trying to think about what, what to do in a, in a larger sense. And we're going to have conflict. And I think that that's important to recognize. It's important to look at each other and say, I know you're on the same side, even though I don't like what the, the way you're going about solving this problem. But all of these solutions together, that is what makes the ripple into a wave. And we're at that moment where five years, we're all real, we're here, we're still a family. And we need to remember that. You know, and like families, I think people assume, especially with my pop, that I grew up with somebody who was like, let your creative heart sing, my child. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I grew up with a writer who was critical and slightly mean. <laughs> I grew up with someone who, when I was very young, I wasn't allowed to say I had an idea for a book. I had to give him an outline. <laughs> All good training. <laughs> but that kind of debate that every creative person in this room understands for themselves, because you've had that fight with the books that you've written, you've had that fight with yourself, that is the kind of fight that we, are, that we need to have together. And it's so good to have these conversations on these stages where we, think, where we think about things like, well, do we want to think of the experience of being a person of color in this country as being simply about trauma? How do we hold trauma? How do we not hold it? How, is, there, is there a way to let it go? These are important questions. And just like my father sat there and said, man, that, that, don't, sound like, that don't sound right. I'm like, would it be a good story and it would sell? And he goes, yeah, but we can do better. That's our job. We're going places. As a family, we, we, we're, we're trying to build a way forward. And it's a gift to see the continuity of this family. Because as I said, I've been, do, I've been seeing this since I was a kid. We're sitting with Nicholas Moore or Sheila Hamanaka, Larry Yep. Folks that have been doing this for, and, and have passed or who we love, this is the continuity of family. That's what family means. And so we find ourselves here thrown up on an island where there's very few images. There's not mirrors, perhaps. There's not photos. And our job was to do what I did on that island that day. We sit there and we sit and we draw each and every kid. And we make this, we, 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 we hope that all of those young people can eventually paste their picture on the side of their thatch roof hut. <laughs> and they will paste the pictures that are written by the new, the, the, the new people writing, the Tiffany's, the Vera's, the Emily's, the Elizabeth's, the David's. This is what we do because we are a family. We look out for each other, and I thank you for making the continuity of my own family, the, both the very personal one and the, the larger one of people who care about books for kids. I thank you all for keeping that continuity going. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay. um, 
One more shout out uh, when I talked about the internships, which is to my amazing committee. The internship committee works their behinds off, and uh, I just get to sign the letters. So they're the ones who do the real work, and if any of them are watching the live stream, thanks, guys. All right. Um, we are going to move on now to the presentation of the Walters for the Younger Reader carat, uh, category. Um, this morning, Meg introduced the honor winners um, in the symposium, which I hope most of you were able to attend because it rocked. Um, and their full bios are in the programs. I would especially draw your attention to their websites or um, other social media handles where you can have them 24-7 in your homes, if you like. So I will be um, giving you just a, a few other little fun facts about them. And I'm going to begin with David Bowles. Um, David is currently developing a TV series based on his book, Border Lore. And this year, Penguin will publish the Chupacapras of the Rio Grande, co-written with Adam Gidwitz. Two books will release Clockwork Cur Curandera. Did I say that right? Corandera, a graphic novel illustrated by Raoul III. And in 2017, David was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters in recognition of his literary accomplishments. About They Call Me Guero, one panelist describes the book as so relatable with that feeling of being close to the reader's experience and singular at the same time. David, will you please come up and accept your Walter honor for They Call Me Guero. Hiranandani's book, The Night Diary, has been featured on NPR's Weekend Edition, is a New York Times editor's choice pick, and was chosen as a 2018 Best Children's Book of the Year by the New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR, Amazon School Library Journal, Kirkus Reviews, <laughs> among others. As a kid, she loved playing video games, especially Pac-Man. That's old school. Right? Her favorite comfort foods are Jewish matzo ball soup and Indian samosas. Comments from the panel. The Night Diary is simply outstanding historical fiction that honors and reveals the complexity of past events. Vera, please come up and accept your Walter honor for The Night Diary. Jewel Parker Rhodes. Jewel. It's got the perfect name, right? Jewel Parker Rhodes middle grade books have won the Coretta Scott King Honor, the Jane Addams Children's Book Award, and more. She is the Virginia C sorry, Virginia G. Piper Endowed Chair in Creative Writing at Arizona State University, and she's written many award-winning books for adults that we don't care about. <laughs> <laughs> She began college as a dance major, but when she discovered that there were novels by African Americans for African Americans, she knew she wanted to be an author. She grew up in a three-story brick house in Pittsburgh, raised by her grandparents, and it was her grandmother who taught her how to tell stories. From a panelist, I love the message of agency and power that transcends life itself and denies victory to those who would try to crush it. And from panel co-chair Maria Salvador, 
Ghost Boys presents a powerful and timely story in a way that is accessible to middle grade readers. Ripples of the past remain in the present and continue to have an impact on the future. Readers, please welcome to the stage the winner of the Walter Award for Younger Readers for Ghost Boys, Jewel Parker Rhodes. I've already started crying. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, We Need Diverse Books and the committee members. Uh, this is such an honor. And this is also the capstone of my career. It really and truly is. When I was asked to write Ghost Boys by Alvina Ling, my editor, Little Brown, you know, like, oh, Jewel, do you want to write about the murder of black boys? What do you say? No, of course not. I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's too hard uh, stylistically. It's too hard emotionally. But my two editors, Alvina Ling and Allison Moore, uh, knew that I had been going through a lot of incidences watching as my young child grew and became the subject of more racism and racial bias. I also had childhood memories of Emmett Till. When I was growing up, you know, the pictures of Emmett Till in his coffin on the anniversary of his death were, you know, just strewn throughout our home. You know, we, we were engaged in seeing racism in our world, I think, because my grandparents wanted to protect us in their way from racism. But the images of Emmett have haunted me for over 65 years. And I still see images of men and women who were lynched, burned, and corkscrewed, some before and some post-death. So in my heart, I kept having this stew of passion. And I thought I had been writing all these years, practicing so hard, that why not try to write this impossible book? And in fact, Linda, all those adult novels that I wrote, <laughs> which we can forget about, <laughs> Those were, in fact, my practice books for trying to become good enough to write for children. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So I like hard things, hard books. Uh, so I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And I mentioned to Alvina, OK, I can write it if I have ghosts. And only years later did she tell me she was really worried about me <laughs> and did not understand. Um, but I went ahead and started the book. And for two and a half years, the book nearly undid me. I would write 28 pages and then send them off to Alvina and say, that's it. I'm done. And she'd say, it's a little short. <laughs> and then I'd write some more, send it off to Alvina and Allison. That's it. I'm done. It came out in bits and pieces. And in between, I would read The Color of Law. I would read Mercy. Um, I would study more history. And I would just weep and cry. But who was my lodestar? Walter Dean Myers. I had read his books as a teenager, as an African-American scholar, and as a mother with my daughter. And in my heart, I knew that to be one-tenth as talented, imaginative, creative as Walter Dean Myers, I just might make it through. His commitment to the 
legacy of diversity, his commitment to excellence just shines. So you know what I picked up? Monster. And it seems so right that today is the 20th anniversary um, publication date of Monster, and I'm here accepting his award. I got to meet him when I finally started my first book for children, Ninth Ward, and I was at the Coretta Scott King Awards. And guess who was standing behind me? Oh, I fangirled. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was embarrassing. <laughs> Who was this shrimp? You know, he was just so wonderful. And I was so struck by his kindness, his humility. He was just absolutely wondered, wonderful. And I thought this was a sign that, yes, I was finally a children's author. And I called my daughter Kelly and said, guess who I met today? And I think for the first time ever, I was cool for my daughter. I was so, so cool. So I took his inspiration, his loathe star of excellence, and I began writing Ghost Boys. Now, I always felt that Emmett Till was innocent, that he did not say, hey, baby. He did not whistle at Miss Carolyn Bryant. He was not sexually assaultive. And yet, for over 60 years, there was all these books that I read, including books for children, all this um, news on the internet that always suggested that somehow the victim may have done something wrong. Well, to me, that was impossible. But I wrote the story, wrote the scene, and then Bill Bryson came out with his book called The Blood of Emmett Till, in which Miss Carolyn Bryan finally said, at the age of 82, I lied. That boy didn't do anything worth dying for. And in fact, this is what, as far as we know, Emmett truly did. He walked into a store ready to get some candy. He gave her the penny for the candy, and he maybe, just maybe, might have touched her fingers or her palm, which was something you shouldn't do. You didn't touch a white woman in the 1950s. But, but who knows, you know? Um, and for, then afterwards, he walked to the door, and he turned around and said, goodbye. That's it. That's it. And I spoke to my wondrous editors at Little Brown, Alice and Alvina, and I said, oh, send me back my manuscript, because it was already in copy editing, right? And I said, send it back. And I was able to rewrite that scene with the knowledge of the real truth that the child was innocent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, Emmett. I also later on, because the books stay with me and I just think and dream about them, was able to make another change. Namely, um, after the book was in an arc, and Carlos, who has given my character Jerome the toy gun, has a moment with his father saying that he feels guilty about giving this toy gun. But there's a beat that I missed. Namely, that as a child of color, as an Hispanic American, it could equally have been Jerome, no, Carlos, who was shot too. So that, to me, was important to add in, that you didn't have to be African American, but simply a child of color, and our society can make an excuse for why you, among others, do not deserve to live. So once again, my wondrous editor said, okay, Jewel, hug, hug, hug. Okay, Jewel, well, well, you, you can make this change. Um, Alvina Ling at Little Brown is the kind of editor that always asked the probing questions that sort of took me down another path and layering the novel, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Allison Moore knows a Jewel Parker road sentence better than I know it myself. So these two women uh, were wondrous, and I honor you. Uh, it does indeed take a village. 
Now, I'm going to tell y'all a secret, <laughs> okay? In 2014, my daughter just had her baby. And everybody had told her that if you're a writer, you can't be a mom. Your life is over. And in fact, when I became a mom, that was when my life began. And particularly as a writer, I tried so hard because I wanted to be able to say to my little girl, don't give up. So here's Kelly, and I'm telling her, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. And she applies for a WNDB fellowship. And she was one of the young mentees selected, and she will have her book published next year, 2020. <laughs> Agnes. <laughs> It's called Agnes in the End of the World. Now, y'all understand that as her mama, what I had to say had nothing to do with it. That as a mama, you can discount whatever I say. Yes, honey, you're good. Oh, forget it. You're my mama. So we need diverse books. You are changing the world. You are making things better. You are making so children can see themselves. You are causing internships, more people who are open to the various cultures and all the multiplicity of humanity. And you are encouraging young writers like my daughter to tell their stories, to tell their truths. And I am forever grateful. So finally, I want to thank my editors, Alvina and Allison. I want to thank Kelly for being my daughter sharing stories and writing dreams with me. I want to thank the committee who selected Ghost Boys. And I'm glad I wrote it. I really am. And if I never write another book again, this was the book I was meant to write. And I want to thank We Need Diverse Books for all that of you have done. And Ellen, I love you so. And dear Walter. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Every good bye ain't gone. For me as a writer, your presence is never more near. For me as a writer, your presence is never more dear. Thank you. fun. <laughs> We're moving on now to the presentation of the Walter Awards in the teen category. Tiffany D. Jackson. In her other life, Tiffany has managed live events, concerts, festival showcases such as the BET Awards and the South by, South by Southwest Music Showcase. As a teen, she loved reading R.L. Stein. <laughs> yeah. Her favorite food is soul food, fried chicken, mac and cheese, candied yams, cornbread, yellow cake with chocolate frosting, or her mom's sweet potato pie. Her next book, which I cannot wait to see, is Let Me Hear a Rhyme, to be published by Catherine Teagan Books in May, right? May? Yeah, soon. We don't have long to wait. Regarding Monday's Not Coming, the panel appreciates the voice and the way the telling of a story can be redemptive and still honor the truth about a tragedy. Tiffany, will you please come up and accept your Walter honor for Monday's Not Coming?
and the suit, right? Am I right? The suit? Yeah. <laughs> Emily XR Pan. The XR stands for her Chinese name, Zhang Ru. Yeah. She is co-creator of Foreshadow, a serial YA anthology with Noba Rensuma. You know, I don't know how I don't know how these people do these things. Like writing books is not enough. Jeez. Her number one piece of advice for aspiring writers is read as much as possible and read a wide variety. The panel, called The Astonishing Color of After, immersive and moving in such a graceful way of blending fantasy and discovery of heritage. Emily, please come up and accept your Walter honor for The Astonishing Color of After. Liz, Liz, Liz. Elizabeth Acevedo is the author of The Poet X. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Which won the ALA Prince Award, the 2018 National Book Award for Young People's Literature, the Boston Globe Horn Book Award, and was a Kirkus Prize finalist. It's one of those ones where you got no more room for no more stickers <laughs> on that cover. She's a national poetry slam champion. She holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Maryland. And her next book, With the Fire on High, great title, will be published by Harper Teen also in May. Her favorite author is Lucille Clifton. Yes. And as further evidence of her utter fearlessness, she was for several years an eighth grade English teacher <laughs> in Prince George's County, Maryland. The panel loved the spark and crackle of Xiomara, her energy and purpose, the musicality of the narrative in verse. Again, from co-chair Maria Salvador, the Poet X presents an authentic story in language that screams to be read aloud, just as Xiomara's own poetry does. Like many young people, Xiomara feels simultaneously seen and invisible in her world. Readers, please welcome Elizabeth Acevedo, winner of the Walter Teen Award for the Poet X. Good afternoon. Um, sorry for not following directions. I got heels on. I can only go so far. <laughs> Doing the best I can. Um, those of you who have seen me speak before, you know I often go off the cuff. Um, I wanted to try something new, so I'm going to read things I wrote. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> it is an honor to be here today, to be in this space. I feel like I'm in the intersection of several parts of my life. I want to tell you all a little bit about the last thing that Linda Sue said. I was an English teacher. I taught eighth grade English in Prince George's County, Maryland. Right? I taught at a school. Oh, yeah. Shout out to the teachers in the room, right? <laughs> and PG. I taught at a school that was 78% Latinx, 18% black. It was a school that had never had a Latinx teacher teach a core subject. It was a school that had never had an Afro-Latina teaching there at all. And there was a connection that I felt with my students that went beyond just wanting to stand in the front of the room. 
that I knew that the reason that I got scholarships to undergrad, that I was able to leave the community that I left, which was at times a rough community, was because of my love for reading, because I was a voracious reader. And I came through a teaching program that I wasn't sure prepared me to do the job I had, which was to stand in front of 150 13 to 16 year olds and teach them how to read, many of whom were on a fifth grade reading level. And the only thing that I had as a guiding light was I have to teach them how to love reading. I don't know about objectives, I don't know about no state tests, I don't know what the fast is. What I know, <laughs> what I know is that if they love to read, they will figure it out, right? And that was the one thing that kept me going. And I had this student who was um, real slick at the mouth, always has something smart to say, the kind of kid who if you're a teacher, right, you always have to be like, that's really inappropriate. And on the inside, you're like, yo, you're so witty. <laughs> like, I would, <laughs> like, I wish I could affirm this part of you, but I can't, right? Classroom management <laughs> does not allow me to do that. <laughs> and and the student was, would tell me, I'm not a reader. I'm not a reader. And I asked her one day, what is it that you want? Like, what book can I get? What would you be interested in? Because I had put everything in front of her I thought would be cool. This is 2012, right? So I'm giving her Hunger Games, Twilight, whatever is, is exciting at the time. And she's like, I don't care about no sparkly vampires. I don't care about no killing no kids for food, right? Like, where are the books about us? Where are the books about us? And so I went out and I bought Sandra Cisnero and Julia Alvarez, right? I got Nikki Grimes and Jacqueline Woodson. I went out and got all of these books that I loved when I was her age that felt like they were speaking to my experiences. And I put it in front of her. And within two weeks, this student who had told me she was not a reader finished everything I put in front of her. And then she looked at me and said, I, what's next? And I'm like, what's next? That's it, right? That's all the books and that's my teacher budget. Like, we're done here. <laughs> But those two questions, that was the first spark I had. Maybe I can write for young people. I'd been a poet for many years, but I did not ever actually write specifically for this demographic. But here was this student who was asking me, what's next? And this moment of, why not me? Why can't I be next? Here I am trying to teach them a love of reading. I know what they want to read. I know how to write. I love the books they're reading. I can figure this out. And so it was really that spark, right, of being an educator and wanting to see my kids and wanting them to see themselves that pushed me forward. It was in this capacity as a teacher um, that I was able to bring so many books into class that I would read out loud. And some of my favorite books to read were Walter Dean Meyer's books, partly because they were so New York at times, right? Like 145th Street is one of the most Harlem books in the world, and I just love being able to be like, I don't know about y'all kids, but I'm enjoying this process, right? <laughs> And it was, it was beautiful for me to have students discover Monster and remember when I first read Monster, to talk about slam and the power of that book and the power of basketball or sports in our lives, especially when you come from certain communities when you feel like here are the exit tickets, here's what we have, and be able to connect in that way. And so I was so thankful, right, to do that job. But I also knew I wanted to focus on creative writing. And in 2012, after two years of teaching, I left to go to, the, the, um, uh, to get my MFA in creative writing at the University of Maryland. My first internship and the only internship I've ever held was here at the Library of Congress in the Poetry and Literature Center upstairs. And so the first event I went to was Natasha Trethewey, the Poet Laureate, reading on this stage. She was so cool, she came through the back. It was amazing. And so when I walked in here today, I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> about to get my Natasha on, right? <laughs> but that it feels like a homecoming to be in this space, to be receiving this award, to be looking at the young people from this area in this room, to know that I was writing for you all in the first place. Um, I wanted to tell you all a little bit more before I hop off stage. I was writing Young Adult in secret. The program that I was in did not feel like one where I could bring in children's literature and it be received well. That when you are in the high arts or the fine arts, there are very specific ideas of what that has to sound like. And so I was writing on the Metro up to Greenbelt. I was writing in between teaching. I was writing while I was supposed to be grading, right? Like I was doing 
this project that I had no idea if it had an audience. I did not know who would read it. I didn't know if the industry was able to handle something that was so damn Dominican and so Afro-Dominican and so New York. Um, I knew I wanted to read it, but I didn't know if there was a readership for this thing that I worked on for years. And then in 2014, Walter and Dean Myers' seminal op-ed, Where Other People of Color and Children's Books, was published. And I read that and I kept my eye out and I thought, oh, wait, wait, I think something might change. And then We Need Diverse Books was founded. And I used my little MFA money, what was left of it, and donated, not because I wanted to like, be like at the front of the line, but because I knew this is a game changer. This is a game changer. Everyone sees what I saw in my classroom. We need to bring these books forward. We need to bring these books forth. And so I'm so honored that it's this award that I am receiving today, that it's all of these connections that bring me into this room. I was emboldened to keep writing because I knew I was no longer alone. I knew that the story I was writing had a home. Right? It felt like a battle cry of folks that were rattling the cages and demanding to be let in. It was a vivid reminder on a daily basis that there was not only room for me and my stories in publishing, but that there was a need for the kinds of stories I wanted to tell and for who I wanted to tell them to. The poet, essayist, and music critic Hanif Adurakib has a quote about Chance the Rapper. Every time I read it, it makes my spine thrum. When I first read it, he was considering hip hop, and it's a little bit different than what, what I apply it to. But he wrote, he, meaning Chance the Rapper, makes music facing his people while also leaving the door open for everyone else to try to work their way in. It was this kind of thinking, this intense focus on not translating myself, on not italicizing or othering myself, on not using kid gloves with my audience and trusting they would do the work. It was that kind of thinking that led me to write something that felt incredibly honest, even at a time when I had no idea who would read it. I didn't know if any publisher would want it. It seems incredibly special that the editor who ended up picking this book, who ended up ushering me through my debut, was Rosemary Brosnan who was the editor for many years of Walter Dean Myers. It feels incredibly important that she was the person who did this work with me, who believed in this book, who was the first editor to reply to my agent and say, yes, yes, this book, right? And she was telling me just yesterday, we were texting, she was like, I was so in awe of Walter. <laughs> I learned so much from him. And I like to think that maybe Walter learned some from her and that I am the like, beneficiary of all that learning, thank goodness, right? <laughs> Someone did that work. Rosemary is not able to be here today, but I wanted to make sure that I brought her into the room, that I said her name here, because there's a lot of folks who want to jump on trends sometimes. There were editors that I spoke to that th said things like, oh, I love the Latinx flavor, as if this was a seasoning that I sprinkled on a novel, and not who I am or what I'm writing. And Rosemary was not that person. She's someone who has been doing the work. And I think it's important to acknowledge those folks, right, that this award is not mine alone, that people who have been championing diversity for years have been here, right? And we have to say their names and remind ourselves that they are here. I do feel like today is an arrival of sorts. Like so many people who didn't know they were guiding my steps are finally in the room for me to thank them. As someone who believes that the ancestors walk with us, I hope that Mr. Walter Dean Myers is in the room today. I hope he knows the work we are doing in his name. I hope he feels that I'm writing in his lineage, that I choose to censor characters and stories that are very rarely centered, that I choose to write about characters of color with tenderness and love and a precision of language and a rigor of ideas that we deserve, that I learned a book could love me back by reading books like his, that I hope I do that every single time I write my own story. I don't subscribe to the idea that writing is therapy. I believe therapy is therapy. <laughs> I do, however, believe that the power of writing love onto the page and sealing that in the direction of an audience, even if it's just an audience of one, yourself, 
is pivotal. I do believe what Mr. Myers once said. I write books for the troubled boy I once was and for the boy who lives within me still. It's what I do. And so while I don't believe that writing is therapy, I do believe that writing can be healing. And it's often as healing for the writer as it is for the reader. I hope to keep writing for myself, for my community, for my former and future students, for all my beloveds. I hope to write them on the page. I want to build a pantheon of characters as rich and nuanced as the people I come from. And I don't want to see, and while I don't see awards and stickers as the end all be all, I do see them as a kind of permission, a kind of cheerleading, as if folks from different walks of life look at my legacy of letters, at this thing that I am building, and are saying in gilded cries, pa'lante, siempre pa'lante. Because when it comes to telling our stories, the only direction to keep our eyes is onward. Thank you so much for this award. Thank you for the committee, and thank you all for being here. Okay, following Chris, Linda Sue, Jewel, and Liz, and the symposium earlier is a setup for failure. Let's just say that. Okay, <laughs> having gotten that out, I'm gonna be even a mood killer further to say, I'm gonna tell you a few rules. Uh, <laughs> but, but at this point, I just wanna say, repeat one thing that, that Chris said that really means a lot. Everything you said means a lot but we are going places as a family. I think we need to keep that in mind because we are a family. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're gonna have some, we're gonna have uh, the authors and the judges, please stay here for some photos. And then we're going to have the authors go into the Weddell Pavilion for, um, for book signing. Um, and so one favor that we're asking, because there are students in the room, and I know that they are dying to get back to their schools for work, <laughs> uh, that we let them go to the head of the line if they have purchased a book and need a, a book sign. And, and one other question, you know, one, one thing to ask is if you don't mind, we don't really have time for individual photos um, and a lot of personalization. So it really is just a book signing, um, with exceptions, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, um, so thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to the Library of Congress. I mean, We Need Diverse Books is so happy to partner. The symposium and the award ceremony uh, means so much to all of us. So thank you for coming and supporting us. Yeah.